Hi. Hello. Hi, guys. We're back. You know, um, I, I want to take a minute, uh, if the audience wouldn't mind just sitting right there, and I want to tell you today that the real fascism is body fascism. Uh, all, all over the world, men of robust proportion like myself go to the theaters every day, and we see movies where where small men are turned into large, muscly men. And it's, uh, you, you know, it's... It, Guys who are not in extraordinary physical shape are the most oppressed group on earth right now. That's what the that's what the trucker protest is all about. It is. It's large men who sit in a chair all day eating sandwiches and and everyone's trying to give us serums that are supposed to make us hotter and healthier and and more desirable to the the bourgeoisie women who have taken all of our jobs and enough is enough. So please Go to www.bodyfascismfaqs.com, my new website, and find out how you can join the fight. <laughs> um, I just think Chris Evans is delicious looking. Um, and yeah, guys, we're we're finally getting to the one Marvel movie that I think we've I mean, I, I knew going in, I knew going in because I've I'm on record for having been a fan of this movie. Captain America is what got me into the Marvel uh, movies at the time I actually did a paper on Agent Carter for my college research project. So I have a history with this and in revisiting it, while I will say it does not hold up to cinematic standards in terms of being a movie, a good movie into, of separate of its intellectual property. But I think we can both agree that this is definitely the best of the first few Marvel movies. I, I called it in in my uh, letterboxed review, uh, another great piece of literary work that I published there. I called it a competent action adventure pulp film. Um, but it is Nicole's favorite movie ever made. Um, <laughs> No, she has not. posters. She's written countless essays. She has a I stack did, of I did fan have fiction a, I did printed have a out, poster, goes up though. to the ceiling. I did. And I she, did have a. Po- I shut up. I did have. I did have a poster. Uh, I got it near Comic Con. I think it was near Comic Con 2012 or 2013. Someone drew Steve Rogers like at the the end credit scene that's reused in the Avengers, where he's going to town on that punching bag. It's like a pinup of him with the like lifting his shirt up it i i had that up until six months ago before i moved and i got rid of it and it, I it was ruined it. by moisture damage ew <laughs> okay well we're we're talking about captain america the last of the pre-avengers marvel movies uh captain america which is the inspiring story of a Soy boy incel who has a heart of gold and he's transformed into a beautifully ripped giga chad to sell war bonds for the U.S. government and fight Nazi occultists, deep scientist division, which is led by Agent Smith and a terrible Halloween mask before he crashes an aircraft into the Arctic and turns into a popsicle for 70 years and he missed his date. And I'm still kind of. Not even kind of sad. That still hurts. He had a date and he missed it. So I, I, my understanding is like he he hasn't fucked up to this point, right? He's Be- bad because he, he's a, they make it a he's point. A, if he has a character flaw, it's that he's bad with women, which he's not really bad with women. He's just he just doesn't know certain like social cues. Like he, he's. That's like his only flaw there is. He has Asperger's one. syndrome. <laughs> okay. Which but. again, like socially, like like mildly autistic men who are not in peak physical condition are the most oppressed group on earth. And this is cultural genocide against us when they turn him into a chad. I Okay, but Peggy was absolutely down to fuck Skinny Steve. And... There, so? She she gave him the oh I want to fuck you eyes during that conversation in the taxi where he was like I am waiting for the right partner and she was like that's just just goddamn fuck me right now 
Listen, I know you're going to go off about how people project stuff that isn't there onto these sort of movies, and I completely agree. But upon this rewatch, I realize what I what is the big strength of this movie is if you're a stupid bisexual like me, you get a hot guy and a hot girl all for the price of one. Two beautiful people to look at, uh, Chris Evans and Haley Atwell. But let's sort of let's start this conversation by talking, going back more to Captain America as a comic book figure and also as a political figure because his his big introduction into the Marvel universe was he was the creation of uh, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon, who were two working class Jewish artists. He's not the creation of Stanley, although I think Stanley did some early writing for a couple Captain America comics, but Captain America is kind of famous for the first issue being him punching Adolf Hitler in the face, which was released about a year before the United States actually went into war. And at least in my understanding, it's kind of understood as a kind of a big deal. Like it's a pol- it was a political statement because at the time we like the United States wasn't uh, didn't really have any sort of opinion on uh, the, the, the uh, European theater. The the sentiment sentiment was before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, very much against entering the war. And and here's why: because people look back at it now, they look at like Charles Lindbergh and the the American far right and their non interventionism, and say, see, the the fascists di- di- didn't want to go to war because they love Nazism and they're selfish and, and American chauvinists. And, but overall, like, like oh, public American public opinion before Pearl Harbor was like, I don't know, 80, 90% against the war. If I'm remembering correctly. It was and, something and like here's, that. It was high. Here's why. Because uh, war is stupid and terrible. Most people knew that. People remembered America's involvement in World War I, which was a largely unproductive disaster that got a bunch of people killed. Um, and they didn't want to do it again because as far as they're concerned, like this is before people really – I mean people knew the Nazis were right-wing and anti-Semitic and bad. you know. Um, but it was before anybody knew that like, oh, there's a, a Holocaust happening, like literally um, for the most part. It, it was really one of those things where anybody in the United States generally knew. Um, and, and it was really one of those things where it's like, why, and now not an unreasonable position to have at the time, why should we get involved in another war between European imperial powers? That's not our business. Um, and I think yeah. that, and, and that, um, and I mean, I guess I'll just say like my, my kind of the thing I want to talk about here, but when we find a moment, uh, down the road is ever since then, Every bad guy America has, or the American government, the empire has picked out, has been Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. And everybody who says, no, we shouldn't go to war, has been painted as a, a Neville Chamberlain appeaser or a, a fascist sympathizer or, or coward who doesn't want to do what's right, who doesn't want to be Captain America and sign up and go fight evil, even though every other bad guy America has ever picked out for itself has never been Adolf Hitler and the Nazis or anything close right. to that. And I think that's, I mean, compared to especially the other fucking Marvel movies we've watched, um, uh, mostly like mostly the Iron Man movies are guilty of this, but it's also spread across even Credible Hulk and Thor. But be- the war on terror, I feel, looms so large in those movies, like you wouldn't have Iron Man in a universe that didn't have a 9-11. It is a very post-war on terror, post-9-11 kind of movie. Um, and that I can't I can't watch these movies without thinking about those politics. And because this is a period piece, and I believe because World War II is in the common sort of thought believed to be a quote unquote and I use this like quote unquote very, very loosely, just war because it was against fascism and Nazis and they were undoubtedly bad. It the politics of this, I guess, are a lot more palatable 
for for me personally, but or or at least for the every man who's looking not to have something that is completely like, oh, this is this is supposed to be about today. This is very current. Because the the nice part about this, when this was released in 2011, there were no conversations about how so and so politician is literally Adolf Hitler, and so and so Nazis are congregating around such and such border. It's like, well, isn't it kind of nice to watch uh, one of these movies and not have it have any sort of like try to be commenting on sort of political events? It's just kind of it's an, a nice it's a it's a self contained period piece. I mean, it's like it's like um, I feel like this movie is very much uh, trading on Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, down to uh, chewing up a guy in a propeller. In, Which is the in... I I forgot that happened. It, it is I think Me the too. most hardcore bit of violence, you know, aside from um, Tim Roth getting yeeted into that tree in the Hulk. That was. But that's more funny. This was just gnarly. That guy got shredded by a plane, plane propeller. That's violent. Yeah, I was um, I was amazed that they got that in there. Um, I I like I was like, oh shit. Admittedly, this is like a very low bar to clear, but this is probably. I mean, it has its moments, but where it's too, uh, too Pokey. weightless. Yeah, but there's moments like there are moments in this movie that are the the best violence that they've ever had in any of these movies. Um, there is a bo- yeah, there's a body count. People get shot. Um, a lot I'm, of people get shot. I'm I don't rely on my sight enough, or at least I didn't rely on the video resolution I was watching to be able to discern if they were actually using real squibs as opposed to post CG. Flash, but it it looks like well, here's, they were here's, using they, they did something kind of weird with this movie, where for a long time, like all through the two thousands, uh, PG thirteen action movies used squibs, but they just like shot dust when guy even when guys got hit directly, mm. it was just like a puff of dust. And uh, this movie, like people bleed when they get shot, at least some of the time, not always, but some yeah, of the time. A but bit. it's like a red mist. Yeah, which is a, yeah. a better than the puff of dust, but it's kind of a strange choice. But they are bleeding. Like um, uh, Carter like pegs that dude in the head when he's driving the car away. Oh, that head head it's, it's a red spray, but it is a blood spray of some kind. Um, so I felt like they were somebody, maybe the director, uh, John, uh, Joe Johnson, was trying trying to push this movie to have a, a, a little bit of an edge uh, more so than these movies usually do. And it's maybe the last we'll see of it in that regard, but it's, it's much appreciated if we're going to yeah. watch all these that somebody at least gives us a little bit. Well, let's, let's a, start a there because um, yes, Joe Johnson is the director of Captain America, the first Avenger. He famously uh, worked for ILM. He worked on both Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars. He came on to the movie. Oh yeah. He, director. he, he yeah. worked on Raiders of the Lost yeah, Ark. That explains a lot then. Exactly. Um, he debuted with, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which was a VHS staple of my childhood. Same. Also directed Jumanji, which is another yes. VHS staple of my childhood. Uh, the movie that probably is what, and by probably I mean arguably what got him the job for Captain America is The Rocketeer, which you said you watched a lot growing up. I just watched a couple days before Captain America. I... I don't know if I watched it a lot growing up, but I remember it from my early childhood. It's um, good. Just like the premise and some of the images. I wanted to rewatch it it's, it's, too for this, but I didn't they lift, manage my lifted, time very well. He lifted a significant amount of things from that movie into Captain America. Like there are a lot of parallels. It's It's very obvious why he was chosen to do this movie. And I think he was probably the perfect director to hand it off to because his his aesthetic choice and the the way he sort of depicts that pulpy 1940s time period feels very apt i, I am the, a sucker the rock, yeah yeah for um 
art deco new deal retro futurism like you know fallout um bioshock that kind of thing um has has always worked for me yeah so i would say if if you're a marvel fan and you really really like captain america i highly highly encourage you to watch the rocketeer which i will say is the better movie because it is not it's it's also a comic book movie and it is also coincidentally a Disney movie, but it, it I don't know, it, it doesn't need, it's from an era that didn't need those sort of like over the top, glossy, smooth, like CG-ness, which is the big, it's, the big it's from 19, of this movie, I think. Yeah, it's uh, from 1991, so everything isn't happening on a green screen. <laughs> uh, some of the effects look, you know, goofy because it was older but it's it's a it's a fun movie alan arkin is great uh i'll definitely be that that will be part one of three at least of mine watch something else's slash watch watch this too because i i would recommend this movie if you are going to watch a mar any marvel movie or at least the first of the pre-avengers one just don't so you can watch Iron Man in this. That's it. Don't you don't need to bother with any of the other ones. Um, but let's 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 talk more about sort of what on behind the scenes because this is also not the first attempt at making a Captain America movie. There was a serial in the 1940s, which is directly parodied in this movie. Which that's that's where the imagery of Captain America with a handgun comes from. I yes. think they did that in the comics for a bit too. Yes. Uh, in the, a, a while ago. Um, and then there was a Captain America movie in the 1970s where he rode a motorcycle. And I think that got a sequel too. Um, but And then in the most recent one prior to uh, First Avenger was Captain America 1990s starring J.D. Salinger's son. Uh, that's famous for Captain America having the plastic ears and the stupid plastic wings and also faking being carsick in order to steal Ned uh, Beatty's car. D directed by noted uh, master of direct video 90 schlock, Albert Pune. Albert Pune. Or Pune. Pune. Uh, Pune. I, P Y U N. I'm, yeah, I'm not exactly More like sure Albert P U N. I don't know. You know, I watched. Uh, just, I forget what it was called. It was sort of a Terminator, um, Blade Runner kind of mishmash movie he did from like ninety two. That was uh, that was a hoot. Like it's not good, but it's the right kind of the right kind of schlocky. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I watched a couple of. Well, I've I've seen the famously Red Letter Media did a best of the worst where they talked about the Captain America movie. Watched that numerous times, but before we started recording, I watched a little compilation of certain moments from the 1990 movie, and oh my god, <laughs> I was I was I almost started crying, laughing. It was I just the just the thought of like this that was what superhero movies used to be. Like that was firmly in that just after Batman or like it was clearly aping off of the success of Batman and just just thinking of like like I'm I'm sorry but I don't think it'll it's very going to be very controversial of me to say that I would take a Marvel movie over like it like I'm like what we have as a Marvel movie now is objectively like a better made movie but it's 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 so interesting to see that we've lost that sort of schlockiness that was yeah. very very key component of those early superhero movie attempts. I mean, accepting the Richard Donner Superman films and to an extent the Tim Burton Batman movies, although they have that kind of certain camp factor, deliberate camp factor, that's what superhero movies were for a long time. They were they were like what video game movies are. They were not taken very, not only not taken very seriously as movies, but they were not taken seriously as like products with a mass appeal. Superheroes were for dorks and kids and people with no taste. Yeah. Um, straight, straight to video you go. 
Um, yeah, and I mean that's why there was like TV shows in the seventies, like uh, Linda Carter, Wonder Woman, uh, um, Hulk, Shazam. Yeah. Um, and another thing we can probably bring up, or is that this this movie also marks the first involvement of Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFreely, who become really key MCU players. They write this movie. They write the other two Captain America movies. They wrote both uh, Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. And they also wrote Thor The Dark World. <laughs> that'll be, it's, I think that'll be the first one we do. And it'll it'll be I'm, most of them when we get there that I haven't yet actually seen. Uh, that it, I saw that in theaters. I don't remember anything about it except that Chris Evans has a cameo in it because I, I pay attention to Chris. I pay attention to Chris Evans. Because... Because you've you've screenshotted every appearance he's ever made in anything, and you've cut out pictures of his head and pasted them on to to other guys that you're in photos. I I have like the Helga Pataki Arnold statue in in my closet, but it's shaped like Chris Evans. <laughs> I oh my god i i haven't I haven't watched Hey Arnold since the nineties. <laughs> wow, how does that hold up? Good. I watched. Um, I, I rewatched an episode with my sister because we watched Twelve Angry Men, and there's the one episode that's a parody of Twelve Angry Men where uh, Curly frames Eugene for pulling the fire alarm, and that the, legendary. I will. Twelve Angry Men is good, but that that episode is definitely definitely one of the greatest television episodes ever made. But I thought uh, about. <laughs> revisiting that because I was kind of curious because I remembered it from when I was a kid and I remember it being kind of different uh, just in general tonally and aesthetically. I mean, um, I, I'm a 90s kid so I still fuck with with 90s Nickelodeon. I grew up on that stuff. Oh, oh same. Um, but I just, there's things I've revisited and things I haven't gotten around to yet and I'm kind of curious about that one. I did I did watch the Spider-Man and X-Men, just a little bit, just a few episodes of the Spider-Man and X-Men cartoons while I was house sitting because I had Disney Plus. I didn't have my laptop yet and um solidly written and voice acted for the, the time but man those were cheaply animated especially the x-men cartoon say they went through uh heim saban okay to, yeah. to make those and that guy is a notorious cheapskate <laughs> i heard a thing from the what a cartoon podcast where when the x-men cartoon was a success cause it was huge it was like a prime yeah. it, it developed it found a prime time audience um Heim Saban cut the writer's salaries because he figured they wouldn't leave a successful show. <laughs> that's that's the kind of cheapskate he is. Ass. Just a, I'm kind of curious about that. I mean, as much as in general, like this, we, we're kind of sick with nostalgia and rehashes. I'm kind of curious about that re, kind of reboot revival they're doing in the 90s X-Men cartoon because this is a rare occasion where you could revive something from the nineties with better animation than it had at the time. True. <laughs> Cause it was, True. it was like the, just very, very cheaply animated. Unfortunately it was, I was watching it and I was like, Oh, this is, this is rough, man. So Stu, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Captain America. Yeah. Apologies. Can you, do, do you also, so do you also think Chris Evans is really, really, really ridiculously good looking? No, because I'm a, a zero on the Kinsey scale. I mean, I'm sure he is. I, I totally okay, believe well, you. I just um, well, okay. So let me. I it, if if it's not been obvious this whole time, he is uh, Chris Evans is one of my biggest like Hollywood crushes. He is also a local boy. He grew up in Sudbury, which is a few towns away from where I grew up. So um, people I actually went to college with who were uh from Sudbury like knew his family and from what I understand is that and this is not just me like being a fan who would like when she was stressed out studying during college she'd watch like compilations of Chris Evans laughing in interviews just stop let me let me let me go on uh, but Look, he's, I, al I he's always say, he's always struck me as a genuinely down to earth and nice guy, even though he's he's arguably like an annoying Hollywood lib or in that circle now. I, I mean, most people have not great politics, and that goes double for 
actors and celebrities. So I, I don't really hold it against them unless it's like, 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 you know, like really like, really like outright white supremacist or something. But I, yeah, no, he, he stays in his lane. I don't think I've ever heard, um, like, I don't think he's ever been the center of any sort of controversy slash cancellation attempts to my understanding the things he loves in his life are his dog and his mom which are very admirable but the the bigger thing i want to point out on this podcast ladies and gentlemen is that chris evans is cool because he does drugs uh, allegedly allegedly uh the famous story on the internet this comes courtesy of thrillist uh and i'm just going to read this directly about captain america super spliffs uh, this is quoted from a anonymous promoter in New York City around the mid 2010s. He said, Chris Evans should roll every joint. He was at our table and someone wanted to get high, but doesn't roll. Chris crushed up weed in one hand and prepared the papers in the other. I blinked and suddenly the weed's all in there and it's neatly twisted into a cone. He even used a drink ticket to make a filter. It happened in less than a minute and he didn't bother sitting. It's one of the best joints I've smoked. Just like I, I'm a legendary, a legendary story. But ladies and gentlemen, we have some exclusive but, Chris Evans but, information. But only, Chris but Evans only a used. man of a man pure of heart should be trusted to wield that power. <laughs> because uh, friend of a pot, friend of the pod, Heartworm, who uh, lovingly designed our our Twitter banner for us, <laughs> told me. Forward this information to me on Instagram. I'm just gonna just gonna read our Instagram exchange. My friend was at a comedy show in LA for her other friend doing stand up. Chris Evans was there and found her set to be really funny, so he invited all of them back to his place. He disappears for a second and comes back out into the living room with a bag of shrooms. They all did mushrooms with Captain America, and at one point, someone convinced him to take his shirt off and show off his muscles. Another person starts feeling his muscles and my friend is like, no, you can't just touch Captain America and ran over to stop them. But by the time they got over to him, they just started touching his muscles, too, because holy shit, they're huge. The next day, they texted him to thank him for the good time. And he texted back <laughs> knife ocean and <laughs> just the the, the emo emoji of the knife and the and the ocean. Uh, which is probably something they talked about while they were on shrooms, but no one remembers, so they so the mystery just remains. And that's and that's our exclusive Chris Evans story. A allegedly, allegedly, courtesy of our, you heard our it friend here of the first. pod. See, I told you, body fascism. If I went and did mushrooms with people, they wouldn't want to grope my muscles. Well, they might want to I touch should my also hair. point out that hair. Chris Evans like denied the role multiple times of playing Captain America because he before before playing Captain America he was probably most famous for playing Johnny Storm in the terrible terrible Fantastic Four movies. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. that uh that that was probably a a bad memory. Those he, were it, those it were was. Bad. He it, from what I get at, he's he doesn't like those movies very much well, who, either. Who he's was? not a fan of his work on on those, and that was sort of the biggest impetus to him wanting to accept another comic book movie job. Um, so I'm gonna I'm I'm going back to Collider's how the MCU was made uh, series because it's 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 easy to to read from and it's pretty cohesive. So uh, I'm just gonna read from them directly um uh that uh, they, they have a couple quotes from chris evans one of them is just he he was just i'm gonna read this to you because this this does sound very genuine to me like i feel like any other actor would have just jumped at the chance to play this sort of role in chris evans he denied it it wasn't until like robert downey jr actually got on the phone with him that he reconsidered taking up the role. But he said, and I quote, well, I wasn't happy in the first cap because, well, not that I wasn't happy. I was just nervous. You know what I mean? 
I had taken a role that I was just nervous about and it was a lifestyle change. And then there are a lot of factors on the first cap. I was just nervous, man. I was, it was a big lifestyle, whatever. And now it's like, I got it. I got it. It's okay. No one's fucking kicking down my door. I can still walk around. I can still go to a movie. I think I was just so scared that like, this is it. I just signed my death warrant. My life's over. I can't believe I did this. This isn't the career I wanted. That didn't happen. None of that shit happened. I'm fine. Fine. Which he, he, he was, he was very, oh, so he, he was very nervous about taking up this role. Like he didn't want to be, um, he, he also famously only signed a six picture deal with Marvel. Whereas like Sebastian Stan, who plays Bucky in, 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 will later go on to be Winter Soldier. He signed like a nine picture deal, which I remember kind of being a point of discussion. And it it, it was arguably because Chris Evans didn't, re- he, he liked being Captain America, but didn't want to be completely tied down to this it, role, which yeah, is why he like eventually he exited with Endgame. Stuck, stuck with it, kind of defining his career and maybe a little scared of being that level of movie star. Although he didn't, he he made a cameo in the fucking Free Guy movie uh, around Captain America, so it's 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 kind and, of and up I'm in the sure air. A dump how... truck full of money made a cameo in his driveway for that one. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I I have not. We I think we should watch that when it becomes chronologically appropriate. I have not seen it. I've seen bits of it, and just the like ninety seconds of it I saw made me so mad. I've never been so mad at a movie in my life, so appalled at its very existence. But um, I think because when we get to that point, when we get to this kind of like um, singularity of self-referencing pop culture that is um, Ready Player One, Space Jam 2, Free Guy, we've got to watch them because it's. I, no. I feel like it's it's part of the wider <laughs> project. It's... So it's- it's like you're gi- you're giving me the option to either like cut my tongue out or stab myself in both eyes, and neither neither of those sound appealing. Uh, but Look, no one here, else does it. <laughs> I know a guy. Here's the deal. I know a guy who does AI deep fakes. I I will AI deep fake just the rowdiest gay porn you've ever seen to look uh, completely just like Chris Evans <laughs> to compensate you emotionally. Okay, but. But 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 also here's the thing because before Chris Evans accepted this role, they were eyeing. Well, they they already had Chris Evans really in really stacked or considered for the role. Like he didn't do a audition compared to the other Marvel mainstays. Like by contrast, Chris Hemsworth had to audition like multiple times. He fucked up the first time, and then they went back and reconsidered him. But before Chris Evans accepted the role, John Krasinski, yes, Office Jim, was uh, given an audition. And just just think of how fucking awful that that this that version of Captain America would have been. Oh, God. Like, yeah, (laughs) fucking. I'm just Jesus Christ. Thank God for Chris. You know what? No, I don't. Well, I mean, here's the thing that might have sunk the MCU. Oh, it would have. Oh, it absolutely would have. So that might would, be one of have. those like things where it's like it would have been worse for the movie, but it might have been better for uh, the film industry overall. Let's, well, let, let's, I, I realize That's we're okay. like over half an hour in and we still haven't talked about the movie proper. <laughs> John, John Krasinski did but, get his own Captain America-esque role as, as Tom Clancy's. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Jack Ryan, uh. We've got to stop Venezuela from getting nukes. Yeah, that makes sense. Like that. Yeah. That's just a plot that was straight up cooked up by the DOD, man. But yeah, so well, I mean, here's the, I mean, the, the, the there's another thing. I don't know if we need to summarize the plots because I, f- I figure like people must know. Um, well, it's, it's 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 pretty. It's very faithful to the comic origins. Like the whole movie itself is very much a throwback to the like classic period of comics it even uh it's you know that that art deco sort of component component yeah. is uh some we already talked a little bit about the pulpy action and just the inherent uh thread of uh 
world because World War II is really where comic books help took off because they became a very um important part of what was being like sent overseas to soldiers um it was like as a form of entertainment um so that's <laughs> but I, I mean this 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 movie which is which is one of those yeah. things that you, makes more sense when you realize that most of the guys fighting are 18 and 19 and are um <laughs> Except Dum Dum Hogan or whatever his name is, he's the, the one guy with the mustache in the Howling Commandos who's just not wearing a helmet. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> just, Neil McDonough. I also think yeah. war movies, like the cast of war movies, are always a bit older. It's just, it's like CW shows, uh, teen dramas, but like your average soldier was college age, like they are just out of childhood, and it's a thing that's like you got to kind of put, especially then when it's like mass enlistment and conscription, it's like a thing that's easy to forget. But then when you put it in perspective, it's like, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, that was, sorry, that was a thought that pop kind of have formed into my head, but I think it's always worth remembering the, or, or uh, it's less significant to think about somehow. <laughs> that's, I was very inarticulate. I'm sorry. It's a, it's all right. I'm, one thing I, I did notice on this watch, and I had the conscious, after I thought of it, I was like, oh, fuck, Stu's going to yell at me. Because this this movie opens in the Arctic, uh, where they discover Steve Rogers' frozen body after being frozen in the ice for 70 years. Uh, as the Captain America lore goes after he was fighting in World War II, uh, had to stop the Red Skull had to crash the plane into the Arctic and he's frozen in ice for the original run of the comics. It's 20 years, obviously, because they're making this in 2010, 2011. They upped it to 70 years. Uh, but I I had the conscious thought. I was like, oh, fuck, this kind of looks like the opening to John Carpenter's The Thing. And then I felt bad for thinking about that. But the, the How Arctic, dare you? The, Ar- the Arctic does that. That opening How shot looks dare very nice. You? It, it's, I, it's, I quit. It, it's I an. Quit it's a. The, the color is nice. <laughs> when it's not CG, of course. When it's not CG. No, no, you're right. It's that that um, that opening sequence looked pretty good and kind of gave me hope for rest of the, what the rest of the movie would look like. And then I was a little disappointed when it cuts to Norway, 1942, and things have that kind of. Marvel movie sheen to them. Yeah, a massive CGI tank rolls into a Norwegian church to even, steal the Tesseract. Even Red Skull's like awesome Nazi supercar is CGI, which yeah. I like. God, if, if yeah. they'd actually built, I mean, they built an actual outrageous car for that oh, League of Story Gentleman so movie, cool. and that was a piece of shit. How come they couldn't do it for this? I mean, the, his car looks cool, but it it would it would be so much cooler if it was not CG, or if, if it was, it was not car. mostly CG. Yeah, like like you could you you can build these props. It's doable. I mean, they did that. You know, I'll give them. I mean, this is those things where it's like, at least they had a prop submarine. Yeah, that that, 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 that I, yeah that sort of looked like a Messer Schmidt two six two. I pointed at my screen when the little prop submarine came out. I was like, <laughs> it's real! It's real! Uh, I mean, when the when the movie isn't using CGI sets, like the production design is very strong in this movie. It's especially compared to all these other Marvel movies. Like you, it, this has a very distinct look and feel to it. The, I I would oh. say this movie has a pulse. <laughs> it has a it has a heart and it has a pulse compared to like the the absolute yeah, lifelessness of it is Hulk and Thor. the best. Of these movies we've watched so far, it's it's a it's a, a, a competent script. It's it's got some solid production design, as you said. The uh, and I don't know if this is Johnston or, or or who's responsible for this, but the 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 sci-fi hydro technology is all very kind of on point for like a Nazi like proto like it was all stuff that like really never got off paper, but like. The thing Red Skull escapes in the the big bomber at the end, all of that stuff looks a lot like like prototype Wunderwaffen from yeah. the late war period, like the America bomber and um, 
uh, the Horton Ho and stuff like that. I think the production, if I, I may be making this up, but I feel like I read somewhere that the production did do some like research into Nazi proto type stuff to get an idea design wise of how this stuff should look. I, I think they may have done that. I'm not sure. They 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 had to have because it's okay. like some of that stuff is like l- almost one for one, um, which I which I got a kick out of as a as a uh, uh, as like the kind of guy that can look at a fighter plane and 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 tell you which fighter plane it is at least sixty percent of the time. Well, speaking of CG effects, I mean the big the the big spectacle CGI CGI effect of this movie is the. Uh, the the incelification of Chris Evans, which the skinny Steve Rogers effect. There there are a couple moments where it still looks wonky, but like I was surprised at how well pretty, it holds pretty up. Pretty seamless when there's a lot of other dodgy CGI in this movie, like like the the hangar fight at the end, which is all green screen. Yeah, and he's running after the plane. That just looks like ass. But uh, but yeah, Twink, um, little Twink. Uh, Steve, Captain Twink, America Twink is, Twink is pretty seamless. It's yeah, it's nowhere near as uncanny looking as fucking Peter Cushing in Rogue One or the fake Luke Skywalker that everyone's really upset about. I I saw a clip of that that was also very horrifying. And this is this is years before Rogue One. This is like five years before Rogue One or something like that. This so it's 2011. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh... Um, um. So I'm. Happy that because that takes up the skinny Steve part. Well, Steve Rogers, he's been his his arc for the first like half an hour of the movie is he's been trying to enlist in the army because he you know he he really wants to fight uh, and and lend a hand, but he has literally every health condition known to man. So they they keep rejecting him, and they had to do because Chris Evans is a very a very uh. Very beautiful, muscular man has a, a, almost like the figure of an Adonis. So they basically had to do like CG plastic surgery, which is the term I think they used. Um, but if yeah, I highly suggest looking up the process they use to do it because it's actually pretty interesting. They use like several different techniques, including having like a body double in addition to doing CG stuff. So yeah, if 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 this if this movie can be credited for one thing, it's that the digital D morphing or technology doesn't look bad, and it's not very distracting. I mean, I I, I feel like he should have committed to it like uh, Christian Bale did, the Machinist, and just like <laughs> starved himself. Just, yeah, just become a skeleton. Uh, have you seen the the Machinist? No, I haven't. But it's, I, there's I, some, I know there's the some famous, shots yeah. of yeah, it's it's creepy. Like how skinny, like he really does look fucked up in that. Like that probably gave him heart damage or something. Um, but yeah, it's it's a pretty seamless effect, and um, and that's one of those things where it's like that's like a appropriate use of CGI. I think. Well, yeah, I mean, well, well, compared to the 1990 Captain America movie with Sadie J D Salinger's kid, uh, he just because J D Salinger's kid, they couldn't do any sort of. CG plastic surgery on him so to 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 show that Steve Rogers is not physically fit before his transformation with the super serum super soldier serum he just like walks with a shitty limp <laughs> so we're 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 getting the best version of Captain America brought to screen arguably um but can can we also low bar to clear <laughs> yeah uh but on on this rewatch, I was really looking out for the uh, the the or as I try to do on any sort of Marvel watch thus far is try to keep the political aspects in line um, in mind. Excuse me, but so so this time I was really thinking, okay, is, what does serving actually mean to Steve? Because I I picked up on a couple of things. There's um, uh, like his big his big character introduction is after after being rejected from uh, enlisting again he he goes to the to the theater there's a newsreel 
uh, about the war. And the newsreel says that every able-bodied man is lining up to serve. And there's sort of like a, like the key word there is able-bodied as it pertains to, to Steve. I, I guess like Steve feels his body and health are holding him back from being able to participate in the war effort um, compared to like every other American man, especially his his best friend, Bucky, who in the comics is a child sidekick. Um, Wait, it, what? Yeah. Yeah, in the comics, Bucky, well, in the original, in the original, like, Golden Age Captain America runner, or at least for the most part, Bucky Barnes is, like, a young, like, teenage boy that Captain America just, like, Steve Rogers just, like, picked up along the way during, like, World War II. They sure liked to do that, huh? But <laughs> I don't like, like what you're insinuating. And... But Look, uh, okay, the... The Spartans had this thing they did where an older warrior would no, mentor no, a younger no, warrior. No, 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 no. Okay. But uh, they, I, I, but I think it was that the old timey version of Bucky that one of the, whoever, whoever it was came up, that came up with the Winter Soldier storyline, like based it off of. So, but obviously, I guess Joe Joe Johnson did the the right decision in this movie by, or or I should say, McFreely and whatever. Uh, I I'm sorry. I know you're. I know you guys' names, but uh, the the screenwriters they they made the right decision not casting like a annoying teenage boy. I, I mean, that was never the boy sidekick thing was never in the cards. No, that's just absolutely not. It, 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 it would have been too, too out of place. It's too goofy. There's way too much pot- potentiality to make Batman style pederasty jokes like <laughs> I just did. Like they're just they're ne- they were never going to do that. Yeah. So when so in this in this version, uh, Bucky Barnes is Steve's childhood friend. They're very very close with each other. I think we'll 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 save a conversation about a potential like queer reading of their relationship because they are a big fandom like slash pairing favorite we'll we'll save that as for a conversation for like winter soldier because we already have a shit ton of our plate here but uh sebastian sam was also uh, one of the people who originally tried out for the captain america part and kevin feige and crew liked him so much that they offered him this part and i think he's quite good like his I I know I I know he comes back in Winter Soldier, but it's like it it sucks when he falls off that train. Nothing good ever happens to Chris Evans on a train. What else has happened to Chris Evans on a train? Snowpiercer. Oh right. He had to eat babies. I forgot that was him. Yeah, I, th- I think that's also. I think Snowpiercer was after Captain America. So if if I'm I I if I'm not mistaken, that would mean probably Bong Joon Ho would have watched Captain America and been like, "I want that guy." They were uh, Snowpiercer was twenty twelve, so I think they they might have been too close May- together. Maybe I'll I I should have looked into that beforehand, but um, yeah, I don't I. The thing about I do like Snowpiercer a lot, though. Let's but. let's let's talk a little bit about like Steve Rogers the man and like the character because he's. Are, are, he's obviously my favorite character and the, the the character that really got me into the MCU and I had to think about that for a while and I realized it's 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 because he's a f- fully morally developed character like he is yeah he is, he, he's, he's the he's heart like, um, he's the heart of this to, to parallel yeah. in parallel to DC he's like Superman that way he has a, a, a fairly clearly defined and like central to his character set of moral principles above and beyond like fights crime, but doesn't kill. Actually, he kills a lot of people. He, he murks a <laughs> lot of Nazis. And I, I, I want to get to the body count thing in a little bit later. I have a, a thing on that. Um, but yeah, like his, you know, he doesn't like his whole motivation is like, you know, his dad died in the war. He doesn't like bullies. He wants to fight the good fight really, really badly. Um, but he really is like, like the whole, the underlying kind of concept, the, the moral framework is there's Red Skull who who lusts for power and domination. 
he he is that the the kind of reactionary um and or maybe more accurately like the if we take liberalism and say there's a, a kind of progressive left wing of liberalism and a reactionary right wing of liberalism uh, uh examples of like the reactionary right wing of liberalism would be like um a randian ism in, in, in a really extreme form um and Red Skull is that mentality of like it's it's a scramble for who can claim power and it goes to whoever has the strength to claim it. And then this is the kind of progressive liberal view of power, which is it should be claimed by people who don't really want it but seek to use it responsibly and, and morally for the benefit of others. That's like the whole Marvel superhero yeah. ethos, excluding Steve Ditko, who was an objectivist. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, especially compared to uh, Tony Stark, like Steve Rogers is the complete opposite of yeah. Tony Stark. They 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 come to have sort of a, 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 a you know flow of egos, come Avengers, and even and then you know Civil War, of course. But he's he's like just he's he's fully realized he doesn't change. He doesn't go through any major character changes like his 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 moral code and who he is as a person doesn't change. He reacts to things. That is that is what yeah. he does. Um and that that feels very classic superhero to me. I've I haven't seen the old like Richard Donner Superman movies or anything, but I I get the feeling that Steve Rogers at least is as he's as he's played in this harkens more to those like classical like just do good not you know like a because nowadays i feel every superhero has to have this you know personal trauma that they're working through and steve eventually you know does kind of have that because he sleeps through 70 fucking years and misses all this sort of shit but it's 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 never about him Solely, like it's compared to Iron Man Two, where we just have to watch Tony Stark drink and piss and shit himself because I'm ah, I'm dying. Yeah, that. Yeah, it's 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 more his real. It's 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 coming into the confidence and ability to to put his moral code in action, and then yeah, to be a a object of comparison against something else. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Well, Steve, Steve is also, he, he shows he's very willing to, like, sacrifice himself from a bodily perspective. Like, you know, he doesn't have this. Yeah, he throws he himself on the, that grenade. Well, yeah, that's, dummy grenade well, that's, that's the big, that's Jones the throws. big sort of character or at least morale establishing scene. But it's obviously, we, we joke, there's not like there's a scene after where he's like, holy shit, my dick is huge. Like, this is awesome. Like, the it's like the, the physical component of it doesn't really so much matter to Steve as it is that he's now in a position where he can, you know, fight back against bullies. Like that's his, 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 but there is something like during that exchange that, uh, Steve and Bucky have early on, it's, it's at the Stark Expo. Um, Steve, what is Steve? He, he says to Steve or Steve says to Bucky, um, what do you want me to do? Collect scrap metal in my little red wagon? I'm not going to sit in a factory, um, which is is both a reference to the newsreel footage because that the newsreel footage that played in the theater before Steve yelled at that guy who was heckling the troops and then got his ass kicked by him. Uh, Everybody's the, the newsreel, doing their part. Yeah, the newsreel. Would you like to know more? Yeah. <laughs> well, the newsreel footage had this little little boy, you know, collecting scrap metal in his wagon and. I, I I picked up on the I'm not going to sit on a factory line because you know who was sitting in the factories it was the women <laughs> because when the, the men the went overseas the one the broads were sitting in the factories because when the men got drafted into the war there the women had to take up their positions and there was a whole this whole switch up of the gender division of labor so and just get I, yeah whole I, limbs amputated by munitions manufacturing equipment. yeah. But it's so I would say there's also sort of a question of masculinity here, whether whether we like reading into it, at least from my perspective, it also somewhat is a question of masculinity, or at least you can read that into it. I think there's 
a substantial enough reading you can make of that. I, I think so. Yeah, it's there's still an implicit kind of the 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 the, the manly thing is to is to go and and fight on the front lines, um, which is really just slap in the face to Kurt Vonnegut, who was a, a conscientious objector and therefore operated strictly as a medic during, if I remember correctly, his participation in World War II. We can't. We can't all be Kurt Vonnegut. Um, God, I wish. I wish <laughs> I could. <laughs> uh, I mean, the other, and and then there's the line later on when Steve is in Europe and uh, is talking to Tommy Lee Jones. Who, God, has he aged since that? Like, I know he's older now, but he just. I feel like he's been old forever. He he's one of those guys. He's just kind of always been old. Like I, I watched, um, I, I really like the movie Eyes of Laura Mars, even though people really dislike it and think it's bad, but he's in that movie and he looks kind uh, of it, young. It, it, cut, is, out, it, it is, cut out on, on Discord right when you said the title of the movie and I don't oh, know what you're talking well, about. <laughs> Eyes of Laura, I, I love this movie called The Eyes of Laura Mars. Um, Tommy Lee Jones is in it and it is the youngest I've ever seen him. Like this is back in like the, the late 70s he he has actually dark hair he's not like silver haired which i feel like he's been since 1985 or whatever but um chester phillips in that moment calls steve a chorus girl (laughs) which is another like a like one of those there's some dialogue here that i've i've because i i have watched this movie in like an academic sense before because i did do my senior research project on Agent Carter, which is the spinoff television spinoff to Captain America. Um, and with, with that, Grace Lee, we're going to transition to talking about Peggy fucking Carter because I, I love Chris Evans and I love Steve Rogers, but Peggy Carter is so fucking cool, <laughs> man. I'm, I'm sorry. Like she is. Compared You're so to- horny this episode. Well, I, I mean, compared to like, we, we already talked about how shitty Black Widow's introduction into the MCU is. Com- compare her, like, Black Widow's first scene to how they introduce Peggy Carter. She decks a guy in the face. Which, you know, here's the thing. It's only in retrospect of being like, uh, having years of epic girl boss stuff where it feels like almost a little corny now to, to introduce yeah. your female character that way and be like yeah she's tough like one of the boys but at the same time like i also am always absolutely thrilled anytime women are doing violence so and, and she she gets a good um headshot on that one nazi driving she, that is that is sick she just domes that guy she, on on screen head fucking headshot um yeah shout out to Haley atwell who um is is great in this movie i i love peggy carter as a character and if if um there's a, another thing this movie i will give this props to is how they actually gave peggy carter a character because she wasn't actually important in the comics she was um and i'm going to i'm going to read from some of my old personal research that i did back in the day because i i i wrote my Senior research paper on uh, Agent Carter about weaponized femininity. So I did some research into like the history of her character in the Marvel comics. And she was completely confined to like Steve's backstory. She wasn't even named until like 19. Hold on. Where is it? We're having a very organized episode. Uh, well, well, you do that, you know. I'll, I'll tell a little, a little story about uh, a time when, when my own masculinity was was. Challenged. Oh, here it is. <laughs> we don't oh, have to mind. listen to it this time. I'll keep that one. It's it's one of my three good stories that I have, so I'll just keep it in my pocket for later. <laughs> we'll, we'll save it. Save it. Um, but uh, so this is this is courtesy of me. Uh, Peggy was a relatively minor character in the comics. Um, She was introduced in 1966, but not identified by name until 1973. Her role as Captain America's love interest during World War II was established completely via flashbacks after he was 
revive from suspended animation, which means Peggy was essentially a backstory character, never given her own series or fer- featured in even like small side parts. So Atwell's version of Peggy Carter is greatly expanded from what role that character had in the original comic run. Um, like she was, I don't, she was, she was blonde also in the original comics then, which, so I, I like that they made her a hot brunette in the movies, a hot, a hot brunette with, with perfect red lipstick. Yeah. Um, I mean that I, I'll admit like that, that forties look is a good one. That should come back. <laughs> and Haley asked Atwell also, uh, I liked this quote that she gave about, her character she said she compared peggy to ginger rogers because she said like she had to do everything her male partner had to do except backwards and in high heels um yeah i i i really i i do really like peggy and granted even though she doesn't really have her own character arc separate from steve's and her relationship to him in this movie she 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 developed enough of a fan base in the MCU that she eventually got her own spin-off TV series which lasted two seasons and then was promptly canceled but she she kept she keeps coming back in the later MCU movies and eventually Steve goes back in time and gets with her and that's what the the real end game was steggy bitches that's <laughs> oh is that see this is where it's like I haven't like passed the first Avengers movie I've only seen like one or two more of them. And I had no idea that's how they close out his story. Yeah, he goes he goes back in time um and, and gets to live out the rest of his life with Peggy. It's it's very sweet. And I I'm I, I'm sorry to say that I cried in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I'm I, if sorry. I was if I was him, I'd bring her into the future because it's like no asbestos uh, HD TVs, uh, yeah, seat I mean, belts, probably Nirvana, way the bras are probably way more comfortable. Yeah, more on terror. Uh, but you'll you'll understand why he because she 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 spoiler alert. Um, and I'm, this probably makes her a lot less cool in everyone's eyes. But Peggy is one of the founders of Shield. This isn't this isn't Shield that's doing the super soldier. Experiment. It is their predecessor, which is the SSRI. The 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 SSRI. SSRI. <laughs> they, they 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 invented uh, antidepressants. Yeah, the SS as part the SSRI. of their research. Uh, God, I I'm I'm blanking on the name strategic right now, SSR, the, the strategic scientific reserve. The strategic um, scientific reserve, which has uh, recruited uh, Doctor Abraham Erskine Erskine Erskine. Oh God, I'm really, I'm really Rich Evans today, aren't I? Uh, but that uh, played by T- Stanley Tucci, who is also doing a very, a very bad German accent. Although he he took this part explicitly because he would be able to do a German accent. Um, I know, I know. Sprechen die Deutsch. And this is, I'm going to take this opportunity now to. Uh, follow up on something I said in the first episode of that we did for Iron Man, because I did bring up um, uh, Stanley Tucci's character, um, Dr. Erskine in like, in comparison to Yinsen, the, uh, the guy Tony Stark is sa- literally saved by and then gets murked. Uh, and I, I said something along the lines of like, you know, they, they keep bringing him up, you know, over the course of the movie. And not really. He after he gets he gets marked, he, you know, points at Steve's chest like, you know, you have big it, hearts. It's what's in your <laughs> like, heart. What's in your heart. E.T. Ho- phone e- home. E.T. phone home. Um, but I and this is this is something that's like we that's also worth discussing um, because Captain America is the creation of two Jewish artists. And in the comics, Dr. Erskine is explicitly a German Jew. No mention is made of him being Jewish in this movie. All all that's given about his backstory is that Adolf Hitler personally sought him out to help him do like 
or head his deep research science division with uh, Johann Sp- Schmidt, who will become Red Skull, aka Hugo Weaving in a terrible Halloween mask. Uh, kind of, it looks all right, but uh, that's there's any any sort of like any any sort of I- identity. Or, or component of Jewishness or like, you know, what the Nazis were really doing is, I think, understandably. Well, that's, like, that's how you know screen. it's a Disney film. Well, yeah, that too. But like, on, on the one hand, you could say like, you know, at the, at the time, the United States didn't know the extent of what was going on in Germany. But on the other hand, I think this movie would be kind of miserable and too serious if it really tried to be like and then captain america freed auschwitz like that would be i i that would be very i mean it it feels like 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 obfuscating the characters uh uh being a being jewish seems like a a miss because i mean you don't need to go too hard on it we all know who the nazis are and what they did um See, it's not like you need to really lean on it, but but hide, but taking that out of it altogether seems like it like it's, it, it it obscures his motivations a little bit. It, like like it just seems like a weird choice, but it's like I feel like if the movie was made a few years later when you know Trump came along and oh, everybody got yeah. got oh. real upset about Nazis again as a going concern, it, they probably would have tried to exploit it more by leaning on it. But I do think because thirty minutes in. Uh, Red Skull just like mercs the Nazi guys that come to have a meeting with them, and then everything's yeah. just the Hydra for the rest of the movie. The Nazis yeah. are kind of out of the picture, yeah, which I think I, is just a massive bitch move. Yeah, the, so Nazi regalia like does appear in this film, which I, I well, well didn't, most of didn't it's remember, Hydra, but it, it it it's there. But yeah, it's, 30 it's minutes Hydra in, regalia that just yeah. looks like Nazi regalia. It's okay. You know what it's like. There's a movie or, or there's a game, an, an NES game called Bionic Commando. Um, the original Japanese version of the game, you're fighting Nazis and you kill a clone of Hitler at the end. Okay. When they released the game in the United States in 1988, 89, whatever it was, the Nintendo was afraid that Nazis were like a too serious, weird thing that would like upset American audiences. So they had the Nazis edit it out. And they're all replaced with an organization called BAD, B A D D, as an acronym. <laughs> and all the swastikas no are, and, are just, all the eagles holding swastikas are changed to just eagles. But the bad guy that you sucks. kill at the end still looks like Hitler. Um, <laughs> but it's like such a, but it's like, like, it, it's just a funny thing with, because Nintendo is like Disney, like, especially with the stuff they do outside Japan, like, con- very conservative about content and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's so funny to think that like Americans will be cagey about killing Nazis in a video game. <laughs> I I mean, isn't what's that? What's that video game where that's the entire like premise? W- Wolfenstein. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, and I think that's also why because Captain America does have, and having been one of those people, I'm sorry to admit. Captain America does have a fairly um, a good portion of the fan base like sees him as a very progressive symbol. Like even like deep, if you go into like the the deep like recesses of like Marvel fandom, there are people who will like swear up and down that like Steve Rogers is a is a socialist anarchist, blah blah blah, which is yeah completely delusional. But like I, I think th- there's yeah there's- certain comics where like definitely left of center authors have yeah. used him as a mouthpiece but that's that's the thing with comics to have so many authors and writers coming and going that the character is like you can find a version of a character to support almost it's like you ever see the D alignment chart and it's all yeah. versions of batman um so like he he could be you can use them that way but it's like in this it's very middle of the road nice liberalism like all these movies are basically what you get in this yeah, I mean, just feels like I bullies, and the Nazis else. are bullies. They, um, yeah, um, and to to the the hold on. I also wrote down the exchange that uh, Stephen Erskine have uh, the the night before his big uh, transformation 
with the super serum or super se- soldier serum uh because it's it's very important there's the and and as you said there's not Whedon-esque speak in this movie even though Joss Whedon did punching up on the script there's 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 jokes but I, th- I think what makes like what what you might call soy dialogue or the, or the quippy thing what what makes it stand out is when it feels out of place to the characters and the context and the emotional stakes when it just feels wrenched in there um and there's it's pretty there's not much of that there's nothing that really stood out to me badly that way um yeah so um Erskine Erskine I keep fucking up his name I'm sorry Stanley Tucci uh Stanley Tucci so I'll just say it Stanley Tucci uh, says this is this is the big explanation about what the super serum super soldier serum does. He says the serum amplifies everything that is inside. So good becomes great, bad becomes worse. This is why you were chosen because a strong man who has known power all his life may lose respect for that power, but a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion. Stay who you are, not a perfect soldier, but a good man. Which which is like the liberal ethos like embodied and that and that's like the whole idea behind popular superhero conventions is they have an innate moral goodness that allows them to justify having this extraordinary power um as opposed to the the question which is worth asking which is rather than who should be allowed to have this power that those who sort of claim it by might or or those who happen into it or, or are granted it due to their their moral virtue is maybe just people no one should have this power or well i mean power as a capital p concept because just the the ability to just be like really really athletic isn't really that big a deal i don't think um although although like the big joke at least when avengers came around was uh aside from hawkeye who's entire thing is he he can just shoot arrows people were just joking like what the fuck's captain america gonna do the laps <laughs> i mean i mean that's i mean black widow also has the same problem. exactly i mean it's, yeah it's, 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 it's kind of thing. the problem with like these characters having completely mismatched con- it's like the problem with the whole superhero crossover thing which again was originally ginned up as a series of sales boosting gimmicks um is like all these characters exist in very different contexts. And it's when you mash them all together, you you have a lot of problems with like their cosmologies, their styles, their their there's power scales, all of it not meshing very neatly. And I mean, I'm sure there's times and places like skilled writers have made that work, but like it's a hard thing to do. And the longer you go on, the more you milk these franchises, the the harder it's gonna get. Um but I wanted to, I wanted to talk about because we we talked about the body count, um, yes. and the fighting of Nazis, and like I want to say, um, uh, from an entertainment perspective, I love a good body count, and uh, the the a, a movie having questionable politics is not in of itself a reason you can't enjoy it. The same way you don't need to invent having good politics, a movie having good politics to justify liking it, which is, I think, what a lot of people do. Like no, you, about, can, you can be like me and just like something because the stars are hot. Yeah, or it's aesthetically yeah. cool. And I mean, movies can be mixed <laughs> too. Like they can have, a movie can have conservative politics overall, but still be insightful about the human condition or this or that or, or have a critique or something, right? Like, um, but yeah, a movie can have terrible politics and still be a, a good piece of art or a great piece of entertainment. Um, but I, I, with that in mind, because um, I always when we when we politically critique these things, like the point is that you're not allowed to like this because of its bad politics. You're not allowed to like it because of the because of the way it's made. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not allow- allowed to like it because it's 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 Disney sloth. You're you're allowed to like things with bad politics. Dune has questionable politics, to say the least. Uh, uh, Conan the Barbarian that movie slaps, but it's it's made by John Milius, who is a, a weird guy uh, politically and otherwise. Um, but uh, as for this movie, there's something I was thinking about. Um, I've developed a, in terms of contemporary events the last few years. I talked about how we all suddenly cared about Nazis again when yeah. Trump got elected as like a going concern. <laughs> I have a theory that 
lacking. So, so for, for, for different demographics, you've got an enemy to scare them into compliance with the state. You've got uh, Arab terrorists, Mexican drug cartels, uh, street hoodlums, uh, Russians, Chinese, communists, Antifa. There, there's certain demographics for which none of those are especially effective. Um, Russia, kind of, because Russia becomes synonymous with like right wing and and reactionary and, and anti liberal and, and authoritarianism and questionable yeah. pol- and but questionable think data mining or whatever. The the, the anxiety is about. And I mean, like you know, there are hard right elements in the United States. There are honest to god Nazis and people who are functionally no different. Um, but the real like. It it is within the liberal state and and the the nice Ivy League educated liberals who end up joining institutions like the CIA, whether or not they self consciously realize it, they're the real fascist threat. Like if if you want to define fascism not aesthetically by but but by what it does in the world, the CIA, which is also like Shield, uh, uh, yeah, an organization that evolved out of a wartime contingency, ha- has been the worldwide Gestapo. Has 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 been the worldwide Fourth Reich. Um, to quote uh, Michael S. Judge um, of the Death is Just Around the Corner podcast, there was a World War III. It was fought across the global south, and the Nazis won. Um, you know, we na- na- Nazism. Nazis. Yeah, Nazism survived World War II and and entered the DNA of the 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 liberal west the 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 declining empires of europe and and uh, the united states um and i think that the 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 obvious nazi the the jack booted skinhead the swastika tattoo guy the proud boy they are real the same way al qaeda was re- is real but they are propped up as a inflated exaggerated threat to scare people into being compliant with the state with the with the status quo with the powers that be who swoop in to protect us from it um and that state that status quo is more is is the real but fascist threat but a fascist threat that's hidden behind the the nice veneer of of human rights liberalism oh we love gay people and we're going to protect them from Vladimir Putin and and everything like that. Um, and I think in this movie, this movie has this body count. You wonder of all the Marvel movies, why is this one allowed to have a body count? And that's because they're fighting the Nazis, Nazis. Or, or, and they're people who are again, because they do split. Like there's, ex, you know, Red Skull is explicitly says like, you know, Hitler, like Hitler's plans are too small for me. Like, yeah, yeah. The Hydra they, split, they, goes they, rogue, they, and theoretically, Hitler was just too busy killing Jews to care that his deep science division was, you know, splitting off. Okay. Yeah. Red Skull <laughs> is a Nazi without the overt Nazism that they were afraid would be too controversial. So he's, 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 I can't believe it's not Nazi. Yeah, um, although although is, the Hydra like guys, they are wearing like pretty funny fascist gimp. The the Hydra personnel are wearing like gimp suits. They got the, the it's a it's a similar like aesthetic, but it's their yeah it's 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 Nazis without the political or like they they there's no the, there's no talk about like a final solution or the. Aryan race. It's but they're, you know they're, they're, they're still, just they're bullies. They're bullies. They're still Nazis. They still have Nazi aesthetics. They're like the Empire in Star Wars. They're still uh, bad guys. Capital B, capital G. That yeah, uh, and and this you can is, dispose of without guilt. Um, yeah, Believe. and that's that's the thing. Um, in in uh, you know like uh, in in uh, the Umberto Eco essay, Ur fascism. Um, he describes, and I mean, it's not, that's not like the best definition of fascism, but if you're going to try and figure out what fascism is, which is a complex, weird topic, it's yeah. worth reading alongside other things. Um, but it, um, he describes how like the, the fascist kind of worldview, the fascist narrative, which serves to bind its designated acceptable group together is a, an extra, a, a group that is both 
an internal infection and an external threat that is always there to oppose you. It's simultaneously inferior to you, but always threatening and always potentially dooming you and, and is so vile and so evil that is completely inhuman. You can do whatever you need to do to fight it and and kill it. Um, and there's this kind of little paradoxical element where within uh, American empire, uh, American liberal empire, um, within this sort of nice smiley face rainbow flag fascism, we find ourselves old fashioned fascism, obvious fascism, uh, swastika, jackboot fascism is that enemy. It is that thing that is it's 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 all around. It's 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 this looming threat that anything can be justified to destroy and 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 its adherents are non-humans that you can kill without remorse or pity by the dozens and hundreds in a way superheroes otherwise generally aren't permitted to kill. Yeah, um, because I mean Nazis are just understood in the common imaginary as the big ultimate bad guy. Like Yeah, yeah, they are me. they've they've completely lost their humanity. They're just e- evil to the core. But they're, but, they're yeah. the bugs and starship troopers. Like, but even even this movie, like, f- because again, I'm I'm it's it's partly because it's like Disney at this point had had already bought Marvel. This was released through Paramount, but Disney by this point was already taking creative control reign. So on the one hand, they can't uh, they can't really lean too far into the Nazi fascism component because it's a Disney property. They have to maintain like a PG-13 rating because, you know, you got to get all the kids to see this. On uh, a soft PG-13. Um, Although, well, this one, yeah, like I said, it's it's got a little more violence than... than a, guy, a guy gets shredded. It is That's, sick. It, that, it's pretty sick, but... And and I, I, I want to make... I just, sorry, just before we move on, I just want to make clear. I'm not saying like, you know, you got to hug it out with the Nazis. I'm just God, saying... No. Like, <laughs> To, to think about the role the enemy and the other serve in fiction and serve in our political narratives and mythology. Because like I said, every every bad guy, America, the empire, sets up for itself to justify all the horrible things it's done it is, is depicted explicitly or implicitly as Nazis from, from the 50s through to George Bush's axis of evil speech to now saying yeah. that Vladimir Putin is a Nazi and any sort of diplomatic arrangement with Russia is Chamberlainian uh, appeasement and, and letting uh, Hitler annex the Sudetenland and so forth. Yeah. Okay, I just, wanted, I just wanted to get out that asterisk uh, uh, before I footnote, before I uh, go on. Sorry. Yeah, but um, sort of the other – very important conversation um this is this is this takes place after um when once erskine notices steve um at the stark expo and recruits him in the exam room he says to steve you want to go overseas and kill some nazis I'm, i tried doing a german accent there but it was about as good as Stanley you, you, Gucci's. yeah <laughs> uh, but uh steve steve says i don't want to kill anyone I don't like bullies. I don't care where they're from, which, again, is a very ideal liberal American ethos when it comes to like our foreign policy and our self-imposed position as like arbiters of world peace in world yeah, politics. It's, it's it's easy not to see yourself as the bully when everybody else is. Yeah, but, you know, but again, it's like... <sighs> I don't, I don't know. This is also just not me, not just me like simping right now, but I just feel like, like there, there's Steve Rogers has like a genuine heart to him. He's because he is the one like main Avenger who at like at the, by the time we get to end game, he complete, he like, after all is said and done, he's like, I'm done. I want to go re- live out the rest of my life here. You guys, you guys go on without me. So he's the one who arguably cares about his powers the least, but has the strongest like moral code. Yeah, um, like so he's, he's he's the most interesting character, especially to me. And the the character and- I think I I feel you feel the most I I feel the most um, interest. In. And I mean, like it is an endearing framing and place to come from for an individual guy. 
And like, I like, I don't think Captain America as a figure is inherent as, as a character is inherently like secretly fascist or necessarily so like yeah no we're not gonna it's talk not about a that bad stupid comic uh that that thing a couple years ago where captain america said hail hydra and the internet f- freaked out that, that <laughs> but it, it's it's <laughs> but it, it's a you know like like that is a perfectly fine um moral framework to give a superhero type character um and and it is and it and he is like endearing like uh uh there there uh a, an honest to goodness person who just wants to do the right thing when they're not insufferable about it is an endearing type of character. Yeah, and that's 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 very much Steve. Like especially compared to Tony Stark, who's just a complete man whore about his fame as Iron Man. Like it's or, yeah, who, or, or, or Thor, is who's completely because up his own he's ass. such an asshole, <laughs> or or Bruce Banner, who's just trying so hard not to nut. Uh, like Steve's relatively like he's he, again he's fully formed. He doesn't have these like inner he traumas that he turns into vendettas against other people. He's just he's very straightforward. He knows what he's about. Um, and he reacts to things. And I I I will say in the subsequent like sequels. Captain America does end up going against the U.S. government a little bit. <laughs> uh, he, because he, he, and and that's a, a little bit of that is kind of set up in this movie because he does show, he does uh, stand up the, that U.S. Senator at the Medal of Honor ceremony. Although Tommy Lee Jones was like, that was cool of you. Um, and, and Chester Phillips is also like a hard, hard nosed, like General Patton sort of character. Uh, oh yeah, not to not to mention. Um, speaking about setting things up for subsequent movies, this movie also. I mean, this is the movie that came right before the Avengers, so it has to set up several things, including like the 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 Tesseract, which is later shown to be the power stone of the Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, this also the, uh, up, the it, MacGuffin yeah, cube, the, the, Mag- the MacGuffin cube, which. I, I think I brought this up on last time uh, when we were talking about Thor because Thor had that stupid ice frost giant cube. Why wasn't that just the Tesseract? I I Why? always thought it was. It wasn't. I always no, it's thought not. it was. No, the yeah, because they're both blue cubes. I always yeah. thought they were the same thing. I remember being like slightly confused watching this. Like, how did it go from Odin's thing and whatever back to Earth in an Indiana Jones? room but i guess they're just two different magic blue cubes that odin o- odin is odin's a big fan of magic blue cubes he he he's, he's collecting magic blue cubes is he's got lots of magic blue believe. cubes he's he's got uh, the tesseract the the ice thing the um odin uh, sleep he yeah sleeps. he's got one of those he blue, sleeps in like a he's got one of those kind of a candy cube? blue eye max that movie sucks uh, you know, well, you know what, what this movie has that Thor doesn't, it has a musical number. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what, what are your, what are your thoughts on the, uh, Star Spangled Man, Stu? Is it, is it a pop um, or what? Does its job? You know, I'm, I'm, you know what, uh, being a musical theater guy, Joss Whedon might've wrote that. I, I, I don't, if he did well, the, punch the, up the, on the movie. Wait, no, I think it was Alan Menken, actually. Wait. Wait, what? what? Or or someone said it was, like, maybe Alan Menken style? Hold on. It was written by... Yes, it was written oh. by Alan Menken. Star, Sp- Star which means, Spangled which Man means is it might have Alan been written Menken by Cock. someone... Who works for Alan Mankin and he took credit for it, but that's no, it. he's nope. It is nope. He's got full credit for songwriting and composing. Um, although- oh, this is, this is a, a friend of a friend told me that <laughs> a friend of he's, a friend of the pod. Uh, well, no, a, yeah, a friend of a, actually no, an absolute friend of the pod. Uh, it gave me a little bit of insider info, and I, um, uh, uh, apparently Mankin is was known for. Uh, you know, taking whole credit for things that came from his staff. 
Oh, um, okay. Uh, although apparently uh, Ashman was dope, though. Okay. Well, Rest in peace. Well, to, I to mean, a real one. I, I, I have. Um, I'm not a big musical theater guy. Neither but am I. I love I, Little I, Shop I hate, of Horrors. I hate theater kids, but this. Um, I, I think this, this, his little, the little propaganda tour. Steve has to go because after after Steve has his grand, uh, chatification transformation, the U.S. government isn't like we're going to send you out in the front lines. They're like. No, this was totally co- a publicity stunt. You're going to be our dancing monkey on our propaganda's tour because we need to sell war bonds, which is it's it's a I I like that section of the movie because it it pokes at the figure of Captain America like in pop culture and as a wartime figure and it's it's it also as, yeah, it, as, it's also as a, a way to get a, a, cute a total propaganda product in. really. You know, an earnest, well-intentioned one, but uh, very much, yeah, a, a more propaganda product. Um, yeah, it, it, although you can definitely argue that this is another case of Marvel, like, gesturing towards deeper criticisms than it actually is making. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. But it's uh, another thing I do want to point out, because I will be somewhat disappointed in myself if I forgot to bring this up but a a, another component of steve rogers character that is in the comics is that steve rogers before he had his uh the super soldier serum he was an artist and that's that's shown a little bit there's where where steve's like behind the uh like it's it's after the disastrous performance he gives on the european front line where where a guy moons him and then everyone throws tomatoes Adam and he's drawing him oh, himself yeah, as yeah, a little that's... monkey. That that is a that is yeah. Again, this is just a this is a, Marvel movies are just like hey look it's a hey look it's a it's an Easter egg for you. But I I hey, also look, do we, like Captain America the artist. Hey look we it's, it's a nice idea. I wish there was that was more explored. Yeah, I do, it's like, I do too. But a lot of that stuff is like hey look we had an intern read the read the Marvel fan wiki and put all this stuff in there. Um, I mean, there, but there I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's movie. a bit of self, if, if that's in if that element is in the original comic, if that's a bit of like a self insert wish fulfillment thing from the original maybe, creators, maybe like we're just, we're, we're these scrawny nerdlingers, but we wish we had the, the wherewithal <gasps> and physical prowess Wait, to go a, cross the ocean and, maybe and it's kick a dig Hitler's at Hitler. ass personally. Maybe it's a dig at Hitler because Hitler was, Famously, I, an artist. Or, I don't know or maybe if anybody I'm would also have, reaching for straws. I, I don't know if anybody would have known about that. Yeah, back that's then. true. Because that's that's such a like History Channel documentary plus internet factoid thing to know about Hitler. Yeah, that yeah, that's true. Um, is that he was an, an aggressively mediocre uh, landscape painter? Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't drawing unicycling monkeys. Um, another thing I want to bring up because I would also kick myself. If I didn't bring this up, um, the the scene, the the scene after after Steve's transformed um, and Erskine gets marked by the Nazi and Steve has to chase him down. Um, I love the behind the scenes photos because Chris Evans is wearing like fake bare feet. Hold on, let me let me see if I can. He, he is thrown through a window and running on glass. Yeah, but it, it, there are a couple of like pictures of him behind the scenes and he's wearing these like they they're comically large like rubber feet and it's 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 really funny to me <laughs> let me see if i can i can find it event and i'll i'll send it to you afterwards but if i definitely look up well don't look up chris evans feet you're gonna get you're gonna get a uh, questionable Things, you're, you're gonna get you're gonna get one of uh, Nicole's no you're websites not she secretly no maintains. you're not uh, but yeah no look up uh, behind the scenes photos of of that particular sequence because they're they're funny um, yeah uh, but if the one thing I, I at least another thing I'll complain about in this movie is Steve's uh, rescue operation of the one hundred seventh because are you he got into Hydra's base really easily. 
He just he just jumped into a van, beat up a couple guys, and just like walked in. Oh, oh that's that's totally. I mean, that's also like Indiana Jones sneaking out of the okay. submarine. Like it's it's always just the plot needs him to get here. So it's like nobody's ever looking. Nobody can hear anything that happens more than three feet away. You just knock a guy out and drag him behind some barrels, and 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 everybody else just happens to turn left when they and not have any. It's like playing. I mean, it really is like Metal Gear movie, movie like pulp movie action movie stealth is really like the original Metal Gear Solid. Everyone's got like a ninety degree cone of vision. I'm I'm gonna admit something, guys. I've never seen Indiana Jones or played Metal Gear. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I, I'm not terribly <laughs> shocked that you're not a big gamer, but I'm astounded you've never seen. Raiders of the Lost Ark. I know. There, I, if, there are if you, a few if you like liked, if you like this if you, and if you like the Rocketeer, you you wouldn't you will enjoy Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh no, I I know. I'll I'll it's 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 a movie that doesn't really I don't need to be told is good and that I'll enjoy. Like I, it it speaks for itself. Like its cultural legacy. It's been like it, it's also just one of those movies. I feel like not that I don't need to see, but is just so pervasive and referenced throughout pop culture that you don't need to have actually sat down and watched the movie to like know where the references are from. That's that's true, but it's I would say it's still worth it. Oh absolutely because that I, that movie yeah. has the guy getting murked by an airplane propeller. And and a guy a and guy's face melts off. That's the other famous yes, thing. Yes, it rules. Which <laughs> looks really cool. <laughs> My mom put that on for my oldest nephew and he was like six and she'd oh, forgotten no. how violent the movie actually oh, was. God. Oh, he, he he was fine. But that sequence, and I knew it was I coming be- and I didn't say nothing because I wanted oh, him to see it. But that my mom was like, out, it, child, his though. face started melting and you could see my mom look on my mom's face like, oh shit, my daughter's going to kill me if he <laughs> mentioned this to her. It's, it's, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but what about Hugo Weaving? We haven't really talked about him much because he he plays Red Skull here, and he was actually he Red Skull comes back in one of the final Avengers movies, but they did not bring Hugo Weaving back. They recast Red Skull, and to oh, my understanding, boo. to my understanding, Hugo Weaving didn't come back because the makeup process that he had to go through in this movie was like so intensive and he also just wasn't really interested in reprising this role or i don't think they even necessarily asked him back i'm I'm not sure fair enough he he doesn't have a ton he he does what he needs to do and he does it well because he's he's hugo weaving and i don't think i've ever seen him not be good in a movie um but uh he's, he's not a ton to red skull I... Like I feel like Hugo Weaving can do a much harsher, nastier German accent than what he gives. Like he can be, I, he can be a lot scarier than how he is in this movie. He's oh, yeah. he's Agent Smith for God's sake. And he can also like he's very good at acting through. Um, like I mean, in V for Vendetta, like that's a I haven't seen that movie since it came out. I don't know entirely how I feel about it overall now as a movie. I'd have to revisit because I'd have I've read the book since the comic book, but um, he 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 is really compelling in that movie despite wearing a mask for all of it. Yeah, which is which is pretty hard to do. So I can see why you'd want a guy who'd act through a prosthesis. Um, it's a it's 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 kind of wild to me that he spent that much time in makeup because he doesn't look bad, but he looks he looks like a Buffy villain. With the red, yeah, I that that did cross my mind. He he, the the red skull face kind of, it it it. Ideally, and that because I'm a I'm a sicko freak. I I would have liked a very much more like horrifying looking red skull. Like imagine a a, a just a, a skull with bloody sinew. Attached to it, that would have been sick. But of course, we can't. We cool. can't have yeah. that because this has to be a PG thirteen. And if they did, it would be like um, Two Face and Dark Knight, and it'd be CGI. And it, yeah, and it would be CGI and wouldn't look very good in certain shots. Um, we really should have just freezed film technology in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, that was once. Once Matrix happened, it was over. Um, Jesus Christ, we haven't even talked about uh, what else haven't we talked about? I I feel like we've 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 covered a lot of ground. I, I got out. I think my main 
theses. Oh, well, um, also, also who shows up in this movie? Because you, uh, Marjorie Tyrell from Game of Thrones. Natalie oh, yeah. Dormer. All time, all time hottie Natalie Dormer. She, um, uh, Peggy catches her smooching Steve. Um, and because Steve is, is, uh, still new to being a Chad and was not getting laid with his little shrimp body. He doesn't know that Marjorie Tyrell is putting the moves on him. So when she smooches uh, Steve and Peggy walks in, she's, she's very upset about that. And I, I, I do like, I like the way that she, she reacts to that. She, because it also, it's also a good way of like showing how the vibra- uh, vibranium shield works because she, she just yeah. like, shoots her gun off at him you know and he i like i like chris evans expression after that he lowers the shield and he he has these like puppy dog eyes he's like why no <laughs> he looks so sad that he got shot at um and and she's of course like oh perfect you know shield works so. I, I just want to say you know if if you're a woman and you you have like any sort of uh, uh, affection towards like a mildly autistic guy, <laughs> you, you really got to make it obvious. He's he's just not going to notice. Like like you you have to be like Natalie Dormer and just like drag him into a room and start making out with him. He's not going to figure out ever. No, he's that you're interested. He's not. Um, but I I I guess to this is a. a <laughs> a public service announcement on behalf of uh, socially oblivious and mildly autistic men everywhere. I mean, it, it, Steve Steve has the best romance in the MCU, arguably. Like I, I my heart still clenched up at the very end when he has to he and Peggy make plans to go to the the store club and in a week, and he's never going to make it because he's got frozen in the ice. And that, that still breaks my heart a little bit. <laughs> and, and I know everything happened. I know he, he he lives out his happy ending at the very end, but that still happens. And it I like he crashes the plane. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like that's that's that sucks. Like I I'll say I, I, I felt a feeling a little bit. Not it, and I mean this movie not has a much, pulse. but it's it's more than I feel watching most of these. Like this is I, I feel like looking at this whole thing st- stretching out in front of us. Like there's probably only two or three other movies coming down the pipe that have a chance of meeting the threshold of like good, yeah. You know, like three stars, three and a half, maybe. Yeah. It's like, if I um, yeah. Ragnarok, I haven't seen Ragnarok, but maybe uh, Rag- Spider-Man: Ragnarok Homecoming, probably. maybe, and Guardians of the Galaxy one, maybe. Yeah, two of those, those I've are- seen, but haven't revisited one of those I've never seen and we'll we'll see that but that's like it that's like the only spots on the horizon that are twinkling with any possibility so uh enjoy it while you can folks well, that, gonna, and actually for the first Avengers itself maybe yeah uh, I, I, I think uh, I'm gonna have fun with the first Avengers not not just because I I really like Captain America's uh suit and that movie people hate that suit but I I I, I think it's nice because it it's it's form fitting and I'm a simp, but uh, this that's not even counting. Like if we decide to, which we might, because there is a finite amount of Marvel property. So I imagine eventually we're gonna try to get into like the DC cinematic universe because well, I've, I've never seen Man of Steel and I I hear it's a I, lot that's the thing as as we. As the Marvel universe, as the Marvel thing takes off, and we start getting films that are trying to copy it or kind of refracting it, and as we get as as the big crossover uh, intersecting properties thing takes off, like I said, we get to those like pop culture reference orgies uh, late near the end of the decade. Um, like I, I do want to branch out into those because I feel like this isn't just. My my idea for this, even going in, was like not just a movie, uh, a podcast about these movies, but they're just kind of like a, a, a backbone and foundation on which to um, do a sort of larger thing. So I am like, I definitely want to do Man of Steel because that Z- Zack Snyder is Zack. Um, uh, <laughs> he's Z- he's Zack a Snyder man. is is you know what? If he is definitely like. In auteur, like I think the reason why people 
were like so into the Snyder Cut thing and stuff is like, whatever you think about his movies, they're Zack Snyder movies, um, which is something, which is, is I think, something. You know you're that watching makes them, a Zack Snyder movie. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's more than you can say about really Marvel movies, generally speaking, especially once yeah. we get past Avengers 1 and we get really in, I think, the meat of what like the MCU really is when or, when the when it when yeah. the machine really comes together into what it is now um, yeah because um unfortunately they did not bring joe johnson back to for any of the captain america sequels instead we got the russo brothers um we'll but we'll we'll get to that eventually we'll we, get there we, what what has joe johnston done since i think captain actually america? i was gonna bring this up because i was looking through his wikipedia they're make they're rebooting Honey I Shrunk the Kids. And guess what it's called? Uh guess what it's gonna be called? Think of think of think of the big trend in like Honey reboot, Honey I Shrunk naming. the Grandkids. No, well think of the think of the big sort of formula for contemporary reboots like uh, okay, I am going through I'm I'm gonna list off a few of them, then after I'm done you tell me if I got anywhere close. So there's Honey, I Shrunk the Grandkids. No. Um, there's Rise of the Shadow of the. No, you're, you're too Shrug- complicated. Or is it's it just, or is it just, think, is it just shrunk? Dumber. Is it think. just shrunk? Yes. <laughs> oh, good lord! Oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Still better, actually. You know, it's still better than um, Stuart Gordon's original title for that movie, uh, well, The what? Teeny Weenies. Uh, oh, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> gross. Um. I mean, would you? Yeah, one 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 degree of separation between Captain America and Reanimator, and that's yeah. Joe Johnston's first movie was Honey I Shrunk the Kids. He was a VFX guy, and he was stepping in because Stuart Gordon got very severely ill as the movie was entering production. Um, so which you know that might be a good if you don't, uh, unless you've got anything else you want to get out. Maybe a good segue into our watch something else. Yeah, I was just about to say because I, I, I'm not gonna. This is a watch something too for me because I I if if let's pretend because sometimes I think of us as I you're Mike Stoklasa and I am a combination of Rich Evans and Jay Bauman because I mispronounce shit all the time and I am I am the 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 cute one. But I, I, if, if I were, I would recommend Captain America, the first Avengers. Like if you were to ask me if, and if this was half in the bag, I would say yes. As far as a Marvel movie goes, I would recommend this. But if you do like this movie or or want to watch something similar to it, but don't want to watch a Marvel movie, definitely watch The Rocketeer. Um, another really good war movie that I watched beforehand because I was intentionally trying to make myself dislike this movie upon rewatch. I watched Porco Rosso for the first time, which is Miyazaki's. Oh, I love Porco yeah, Rosso. Uh, really like that. I, I love, but Miyazaki movies. It's, it's, just, it's where Miyazaki can yeah. really, really get into his airplane thing. Oh, he's he's an airplane guy. He's he's a plane he's he's a plane guy. Have uh, have you seen have you seen The Wind Rises? I have. How do we feel about what's essentially like a puff piece on the guy who designed See, I didn't, I didn't Australia read it Empire. that way. Okay. Um, it's it's I, been a I couple years since way. I've seen it. <laughs> Had, uh I mean in the original in the Japanese dub, do you know who voices the main yes. character? Yes. My, yes. My boy. Uh, my the, boy. The airplanes, gave him the, that the whole thing is so sad. The airplanes are anime, yeah. And the whole thing's about the being melancholic, uh, about like wanting to pursue your dream, but at the same time having to produce products for a society you don't That's really approve true. of, and, and this sort of thing, right? That's true. I mean, it's I I like the Wind Rises. It's not in my top tier of like Ghibli movies, um, but. So what's what's yeah what's your uh watch something else? <laughs> uh well I'm going to say Raiders of the Lost Ark and you know what I'll throw Last Crusade in there too for very very much what 
tonally kind of where this movie is fighting Nazis, occult stuff, that kind of thing. It's it's Anna Jones. What else is there to say? And um, I'm going to say, if you want to watch a World War II movie, um, Cross of Iron, the set, the 1977 Sam Peckinpah film about Nazis on the Eastern Front when the tides have turned and the Russians are coming upon them relentlessly. I, I love that director. I've I've never seen a Peckinpah movie, but his his last name is so fun to say. Peckinpah. 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 There I've only seen a couple. I've seen The Wild Bunch, I've seen Cross of Iron, and I've seen uh, a kind of screwball Death of the West comedy he did that isn't super well remembered called The Ballad of Cable Hogue. That's pretty enjoyable. Okay. I still need to see Straw Dogs. Um Oh yeah, no, I I that's also <laughs> Another movie. That's, that's, I need that to seems add like to a very Nicole Core movie, <laughs> uh, where a woman gets horribly raped. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That. Well, thank you guys for listening to me freak out about how hot Chris Evans is for nearly two hours, and Stu have to put up with it. <laughs> Oh, I had fun. He, he had, I hope I wasn't too fun. We had fun. Too harsh with the teasing. I <laughs> we had we had fun. Um, but uh, yeah, next time presumably we'll be doing the penultimate Marvel movie, The Avengers. So that's that's going to be Eric, fun. Look, look forward to that. The big one. The big. That'll be our kind of crossing the threshold into the MCU proper. Um. And I just want to say, if you want to know how you can do your part, please um, follow our Twitter account. Uh, Mar- at Marvelous Death on Twitter. On Twitter. <laughs> um, leave some positive, preferably reviews. Just, you know, if you know anybody that's like, hey, I think they'd enjoy this podcast. Don't hesitate to just hard sell, just aggressively demand. They listen to every episode of our show three or four times in a row. Um, Download it onto their iPhones without them knowing. You don't need to tell them. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll pull a U two. Yeah, we'll we'll do. Remember when they did that? That was no one (laughs) fucking listened to that album. Everyone deleted that off their iTunes as soon as it got there, and then they realized they couldn't or something. But uh, you can follow me at Kunsaragi on Twitter and Letterboxd. And where can they find you? Uh, Discord Stew, just about anywhere I am, you'll find me under that handle. Um, and again, thank you so much for, for listening. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the show, and uh, I hope whatever you have a great whatever time of day it is um, as you're listening to this. Good night, guys. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you next time. Good night. <laughs>